have confidence in the skill set that we really have and let us have value. Give yourself a value by being confident in the skill that you really have. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already gone and checked out our free 60-minute masterclass, what are you waiting for? We've spent over a decade putting together all the information and resources in that action-packed 60 minutes. would love to see you on that webinar. If you go to smartpracticemethod.com, you'll be able to enter your email address there and watch it in the privacy of your own home. We're going to be talking about the pillars of the smart practice method, as well as some of the major myths that keep architects chained to their businesses instead of being able to enjoy architectural freedom. That's smartpracticemethod.com. It's time to announce this month's 200 Club. If you missed our episode on the 200 Club, listen to BOA episode 485 to learn more about this new initiative to benchmarking small firm performance. Congratulations to Drew and Justine Tyndall, Christopher Brandon, Sven Levine, Mark Elster, Ramiro Torres, Thomas Norton, Ian and Tony Wilson, Yost Bende, Molly Willock, and Jeff Frame. Great job to all our 200 Club members. Today's episode is sponsored by Enscape. Enscape is a plugin software that simplifies real-time visualization for us in the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. Whether your go-to design application is Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD, or Vectorworks, Enscape lets you instantly create high-quality renderings by syncing data from your 3D model without additional import or export needed. Easily navigate every aspect of your design in real time and identify and resolve any issues that you come across. Plus, you can immerse your clients as an added bonus in VR to provide a real tangible sense of the project. Enscape is used by over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries, and you can experience it yourself. We encourage you to go check it out at chaos-enscape.com forward slash trial-14 or simply by Googling try Enscape. You can also find the link in the notes of this podcast episode. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about freedom. And on the podcast today, I have Joe Russo. Joe is an carpenter and architect. And a little backstory on this, and I'll talk a little, little bit more about this when, when Joe hops on here and we say hello. Joe reached out to me back in, in May and wanted just to really contribute to the conversation uh, around this idea of permitting, how to go from red tape to red carpet. You know, the red tape, you know, dealing with permit officials and people who are always telling us that we did the drawings wrong or marking stuff up or holding our feet over the fire to you know, slowing down the process. It can be a real nightmare and headache for us architects to deal with this permitting process. Now, Joe, in his brilliance, realized this and started to notice that there were certain things that were useful as he started to interact with permit officials. He started to see that, you know what, not all approaches are created equal. Sometimes we can actually slow down the process through what we do and how we show up and how we behave with the the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction, as we say here in the United States. And he actually developed a process and has some very good suggestions about how we as architects can work well with these authorities that we know are an important and necessary part of the process and how we can work together as colleagues, but also how we can utilize their expertise, their knowledge to actually facilitate our projects and actually to get our projects through more quickly through the permitting process. So if you're anything like me, Uh, as I was when I was practicing full-time as an architect, you're super excited for this episode because permitting, you know, the permitting authorities are probably, if if you're working with them like I was, they are a thorn in your side. And, um, you know, sometimes they would probably say the same about us architects, undoubtedly. So this will be a great conversation, and I'm super excited to have Joe here on the podcast today. Hello, Joe. Welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you so much, Enoch. I am totally fed up with these people that you described and I am fired up to talk with you about that. It sounds like you must have some personal experience based upon this. So jump into it. When did you first become like, tell me when this, this, this issue arose and, and your first challenge where you really thought, you know, this is, this is something's messed up here. You know, it, if you want to go way back, the, the very first foray into this uh, actually had really nothing to do with permitting. It was just about how authorities uh, treat citizens in general. And it was really related to a a traffic citation. And I used that experience of learning how to deal with that 
and uh, realizing that, wow, I can really incorporate the process that I used here in uh, my, my practice as an architect. Um, and it basically just boiled down to the fact that I, I got pulled over for, for speeding. And when that officer gave me uh, the citation, he also gave me another one because my license plate was not on my front bumper. It was on the, on the dashboard of my car. Uh, so that it kind of gave me insult to injury to have that second citation. And the way this developed was I looked at the code that he cited on, on the citation. And as an architect, I was always you know used to reading codes. And at that point in my early career, I didn't really make the connection that what the rules say and what the reality to your situation are doesn't always mean that that authority figure is correct. So here's, here's what it was. The, the way the rule was worded in the municipal code in that jurisdiction said that your license plate must be displayed within one feet and four feet of the ground at the front of your vehicle. So I really thought about that and decided, wow, I was driving a, a sports car, so low to the ground, and my dashboard was within that range of one, one feet to four feet. So I took a picture with a, a measuring tape and um, then I thought about, all right, front of the vehicle, where is the front of the vehicle? And I decided, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go into court and fight this. So I, I asked the judge very politely, I was very nervous, and I said, sir, can I just indulge you with a question? When you drive your vehicle, do you sit in the front seat or the back seat of your vehicle? And he laughed and said, well, of course I sit in the front. And I said, well, me too, I also sit in the front. So therefore, when you drive, is your dashboard further forward from where you sit? And he said, yes. And I said, yeah, mine too. And that happens to be to where I had my license plate displayed because I didn't want to drill a, a hole in the, the nice bumper of my beautiful sports car. So I told the judge, you know, you've, you've kind of defined where the front of the vehicle as the place where you sit when you drive and the dashboard is also the front. And here's what your law says the front of the vehicle within one to four feet above the ground. And I showed him the picture with the tape measure and he laughed and he agreed with me. He said, yeah, you're, you're right. You, you are following the rules. You should not have gotten that citation, but I understand you know, why you did. And he, and he threw it out. And from that experience, I started to realize that I can do the same thing with the um, review notices that I get from building departments to determine if the rules that they, they say that we're not adhering to when we, we drop our plans are actually things that, that matter. Um, there's a big difference though between you know where you put a license plate and a building that needs to really protect people, right? So it's all it all boils down to me to is the building doing its job to meet the client's needs, budget and all that stuff, but is it is it really safe? Is it satisfying the intent of the code? And most of the time, when architects design stuff, I think it does. I think we have really good intentions, and we do our best to uh, follow what all of the codes tell us to do. And we propose a solution that we believe adheres to those codes. But then we get these review notices, like you mentioned, that says the contrary, that we have not complied with, with whatever. And it really boils down to some sort of gray area that a code reviewer or a building department reviewer is interpreting in some way differently than how we have interpreted it. And that's where the permit problem guide uh, comes in because we've developed a process that we use to try and engage with the building department reviewers to really join our team, to be part of the process rather than just to be an adversary that says no all the time. I'd love to hear some some horror stories you may have heard of, and I'll share one myself. I'm sure our listeners can empathize with this. Here in California, one of the things that I did while full-time practicing architecture was healthcare architecture. And as a part of that, not only do we have the building code, but we also have all the OSHPOD regulations, which stands for the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development or something like that, right? Now, OSHPOD is a great, great organization, and they make sure that uh, the stringent rules and regulations are applied to hospital facilities, inpatient, outpatient facilities in, in, the, in California. 
And I remember that as a young project architect, like my primary duty, like definitely I needed to know about the technical aspects and I needed to know about egress and I needed to know about, you know, how big an operating room should be, how much space needed to be in a patient bedroom and all those kind of things that were clearly outlined in the code. However, what I saw, it was like the principal of the firm that like his magic sauce was not only a deep knowledge of all those things as well, but he had relationships with the people at the office of statewide health planning. And so there's a Sacramento office and there's a Los Angeles office. And I remember one particular phone call because these people were the bane of my existence. I mean, complete. It's literally one of the things that really fed me up with architecture because I'm like, I just can't deal with all this red tape. But I remember there was a project that had been, it was, it was just, it was kind of in this limbo. It had been like three, three revisions already. And uh, just back check comments, right? It was the same thing. It was kind of getting caught up in the same thing. And so the principal comes in and he's like, Enoch, we really need to move this thing along. It's been in, it's been, in, uh, you know, it's been at Oshpod for way too long. So the state fire marshal was the one who was holding it up. And, and I was talking with her, the representative from the fire marshal office. And, and she, she took exception to a column detail. So there was a particular column detail that included, of course, you know, for a particular class of buildings, you need to have fireproofing, that's one hour, you know, whether it's where it's at in the building, egress quarters, et cetera, all your fire ratings. And then of course you need to have, it needs to be UL listed, underwriters laboratories is what we use out here. And then also you need to have a, a column head detail that matches the column, right? Um, which in theory works out great. But if you've ever seen a UL listing book, they're like this thick and you may not, if you're listening, I'm holding my hands up as thick as I can. <laughs> my hand, you know, between my, it's like, you know, three or three or four inches thick this uh, UL listing book, and you're supposed to go through there and you're supposed to find the right fire rating and the column, and then you have to go find the head detail that matches that. And typically these are all standard details. So typically you just copy and paste what you did from another job and you're good to go. Well, for whatever reason, like this particular situation, I don't remember the exact situation, but the way the column was situated and the way the gypsum board wrapped around that column and the way the fireproofing was and the way it attached the head detail, there was literally no approved UL combination for this particular condition. And so she had, she had put it back to me and we'd whittle down all the comments. It was just this one thing, just this one thing that was keeping this project from getting approved. And so I'm on the phone with her and I, I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm like, I don't remember what her name is, Lindsay or something. I said, Lindsay, I said, you know, you've got to help me out here. I mean, I know other practices, no other firms, they're getting this approved all the time. And I know they have the exact same, you know, column detail and head detail condition that we have right here that we're showing in the drawings. And she, she went off the record and she's like, well, you know what they usually do? I said, no, please tell me, how do they, how do they, how do they do this? She's like, well, what they do is they draw it up one way. And then when it gets in the field, they do it another way. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and I'm like, so we just spent three months going back and forth. And what you're telling me is there's no solution here and there's no flexibility. And I have to do it the letter of the law, even though you know that the letter of the law literally is not practical or even possible. She's like, "Yep, yeah, that's right. I said, okay, I'm making the change. Um, I'll send it over today. And, uh, you know, she signed it and sent it back the next day. So <laughs> it was like, I was like going home, like crossing a bridge and thinking, is it worth it? And I'm like, no, I have kids. I have a family. Probably wouldn't be good to drive <laughs> off the bridge right now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, Joe, what, what, have, what have you, you probably heard worse than that. Man, it's, it's. It's crazy because that ultimately is what a lot of these things boil down to, the kind of the connection between what happens on paper and what happens in the actual built environment. I always say I, I, I feel so bad for, for builders that have to take these drawings that we're creating and, I, and drawings in quotes because they're, they're not really drawings anymore. They're, they're like these, these really thick manuals of text and you'd have to be a a PhD and multiple things to be able to really figure out how how to really put these drawings together or, or to build what these drawings say because there's so many cross references so many references to these codes that we're really just putting in there for CYA to to please the Lindsay's out there and we do that to get through the, the permit process and the the Lindsay's know that it's it's going to be fine we know that it's going to be fine the builders want to build it so that it, it's going to work and we're all working as as a team for the for the most part 
and uh, we, we all know that it's not going to be built exactly the way that it's put on paper. Uh, we've, we've seen every single building in the history of time get built differently than what, what the drawings say because there's a very, very big disconnect bet between the two. So that story that you told really, really rings true that if we can wrap our minds around that as architects and really understand the connection between how things get built and what we put on paper, I think we can do a better job of not only designing better buildings, but uh, creating better relationships with the builders and getting these things permitted a bit quicker. Because at the end of the day, uh, the, the Lindsay's out there, um, they, they have a checklist. There's a checklist and they have to go through it and they have to mark their boxes. And we just need them to, to mark those boxes. And then once it's off their plate, then there's an inspector that we have to deal with. And that inspector is going to have a different checklist and, and different things that they're, they're personally concerned with. And we're going to have to please them next or more so the builder is going to have to please them next. And that is the part of the process where as a architect, if we can really engage with that and focus on the parts of the process that matter at that particular time, we're just going to set ourselves up for more success. And it's as simple as that. So it's a matter mm -hmm. of how do you do that? How do you set yourself self up for success? It boils down to, like you mentioned, your boss at the time had relationship with the people like her. He knew the, the people that worked in those departments and they had a relationship with one another. And because of that relationship, he was able to find success. But what happens for the architects out there that are uh, just getting started, the new entrepreneurs that don't have uh, relationships already formulated with these people? or you're working in a place where you've never worked before. You don't have that predetermined relationship where they already like you, or maybe they already hate you. Maybe they do know you and they just don't like you. Or maybe they're having a bad day and they're just gonna take it out on you no matter what the situation is. They're gonna make it personal. So- Yeah, because let's just pause you there for a second. Yeah. In, in my experience, and tell me if this is, if you find the same thing to be true, within the bounds of which they are interested, they do have a lot of flexibility about what they can do. So, you know, how upset they are that day or how great their day is, is gonna have a huge impact on what they do during the daytime. Sort of like, like you mentioned with the citation, when I get pulled over by a cop and he's been dealing with the past people who were saying, why'd you pull me over? Give him excuses, doing all the things that he hates and he pulls me over, it's like ticket, no problem. When I'm the first guy who pulls over the day and I'm like profusely, oh, I was totally speeding, didn't even see that, I deserve it, you know. It's my tax, I haven't gotten a ticket in a while anyways. Hey, it goes towards goes towards the making better roads, you know, I'm happy to pay it. He's He or she will be more likely to be lenient. Uh, do you find that to be true as well with the? Absolutely. Permit departments? Yes, a absolutely. I mean, these are, they're, they're people. We have good days, we have bad days, so. Wait, hold on. They're these 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 are people. They are people. Some, I've questioned Phoenix. this before, yes. Joe. <laughs> questioned, I'm like, they got to be robots. They're cyborgs. Yeah, some of them questionable. We, we'll have to uh, yeah, confirm yeah. that scientifically. Yeah, they but... might. They might be. They might be AI. Or soon yeah. they will be. Can you soon, imagine yeah. when it goes to AI? Yeah. Do you Who think? Knows? Do you think this is possible? Do you think how far off do you think AI for permit permit drawings and plan checking is? Boy, I, I that that's a hard one. But I, I think like anything else. There are elements of that job that will be artificial intelligence in the near, very near future. There, maybe there already are. In fact, I um, had a situation just last week where I had a permit problem and I learned later that it was a result of some back-end AI software that they, they use at the building department that put things into the wrong category. Mm. And had I not fought it, and asked why, why is this a problem? Um, it would have stayed a problem. And I think that's where us as architects fall into this category that we so commonly fall into where we just allow everybody to take advantage of us. Whether it's clients not wanting to pay us what we're worth, whether it's builders not 
building the things that we've designed, uh, they're going to build it the way they want to build it. Um, or building departments telling us what the rules are. In fact, when they're not even rules a lot of the times, it's just that person's opinion on how they're having, you know, they're having a bad day and they're going to make up the rule and, and make themselves feel important. So, yeah, at, at the end of the day, we have to be able to uh, stand up for ourselves, not let people take advantage of us and have confidence in the skill set that we really have and let us have value. Give yourself value by being confident in the skill that you really have. So in the context of permit problems, it's really about looking at the, the issue and understanding, is there a problem? And asking well, I'm going to pause right here, Joe, why. just for a second, just for yeah. a second. Hey, before, before we jump into the solution, we definitely want to get there. I'd love to hear from your perspective, uh, any, any horror stories that come to mind? What are some of the, the most gritty things that you've seen, either from others or from yourself, that have just been eye-turners or just like, oh, come yeah, on. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to start with a very quick and simple one, and then I'll give you another one next. So a, a very simple one, this was just yesterday. A building department is asking me to fill out a compliance form that, that basically just says, yeah, we've built this building and used this kind of insulation. Um, it's built and it complies. So you, you fill out the form after the building is built. Well, they were telling me to fill it out before the building was built. There, there was no way to test the uh, infiltration rates of a building that's not built yet because it's not built yet. And they were insisting that we filled out the form. And in, in, in my um, defiant mind, I can't just go along with what they say. I have to ask why and sort of put them in their place. So that's a very small example of just standing up for yourself and establishing, hey, I, I have this skill set, I have the knowledge. Um, I'm not just going to do it because you told me to do it. Um, so that's a quick example. Um, another example that's uh, a little bit more in depth that um, I, I would love to share because this one really made me feel good to help this person. You know, if you if you asked me, you know, uh, 15 years ago when I was a, a young architect, hey, what's the best part of your job? I'd probably describe something about a, a beautiful building that I designed. But I think if you ask me now, a story like the one I'm about to tell you is, is going to be really, really high on that list because this is a situation where um, a homeowner gets a violation notice in the mail and they are just beside themselves. They're scared. They're facing fines. They can't sleep at night. Their relationship with their wife and, and family is going downhill because they are so scared about a violation notice they get in the mail. And what this situation is, it's, it's about me helping this person to get to the other side. All right, so you ready to hear what the story is? I'm all ears. All right, here we go. So picture a retired veteran. He's, he, he worked, uh, he, he served in the military, defended his country, um, got a job, worked his 30 years, collecting his retirement, he's paid off his house, things are good. He's happy, um, bills are paid for. One day he's out there cutting the grass. The lawnmower kicks up a rock. The rock smacks a window on the side of his attached garage and breaks it. So this window is, it's, it's really long. It's like a, a six or eight foot long window and it's thin or, or not, not so high. It's, I think it was like one foot high and like six or eight feet long. So a very weird shaped window, not something easy to replace. So in an effort to replace this window, he takes it out and goes to one of the hardware stores and, and picks up like three smaller windows that will fit into that opening. And he gets, he gets that installed and as he's, as he's doing that work, he realizes, oh, there's, um, there's some wiring behind my drywall here. So as he's peeling away the layers, getting these windows installed, he sees this wiring and he does what he believes is the right thing. And he calls in a licensed electrician to uh, change out that, that really old wiring. And the licensed electrician calls for a electrical inspection. And guess what the electrical inspector does? 
he calls the building department and says, hey, you have a guy here doing unpermitted work. He needs a building permit because he just put a new window in his attached garage. So then he gets this violation. He's, he's, he can't sleep. He's, he's worried, all this. And then he, he ends up calling me and says, hey, Josh, just, just what, what, should I, what should I do? Like, how, how do I get through this? And, uh, and I said, don't worry, you're, you know, your, your problem is now mine. I'm going to get you through this. Uh, don't worry about it. The fines that you're facing are not a big deal. I'm going to get those waived. Uh, because in reality here, you don't need a permit. There is no reason to have a building permit for replacing a window within an existing opening. You didn't change the structure. It's an unheated space. They don't even need to meet the energy code. Um, so I, I, I coach him through all this stuff and I tell him what he needs to say to the building department. And then he kind of reports back to me with, with what they come back with next. And they tell him that he needs to have a, uh, a drywall permit. And I tell him, what is a drywall permit? There's building permits, there's plumbing permits, there's elect, what is a drywall permit? And he said, I don't know, but that's what they said that I need. And I said, did they tell you, is there a form or something you have to fill out to get your drywall permit? And he said, well, they, they told me to fill out the building permit form and to just write drywall permit at the top. And I said, all right, I'm, I'm getting fired up here, Enoch. Like this, this stuff just drives me crazy. So, it, I mean, it's not even about like earning an income at this point for me. I just want to just want to help this guy. I want to put these people in their place. So they, he made it personal for me. So I'm I'm there and, I, and I'm like, all right. I need to I need to keep my cool. I need to make sure that I don't call up this building department and, and irritate somebody or tell him something that will irritate them because they'll make the problem even worse. So I just provided him with with some information and, and said, hey, uh, there, we can't find a, a drywall permit form in your list of forms available. We can't find any codes. Can you just teach us more about what those requirements are so that we could try to follow them? Right, so he, so he was trying to act like the good guy trying to follow their process. And then it turns out they, they obviously can't cite any information in their codes that, or, or forms that are for drywall only. And they just uh, waived the whole thing. And he did what he needed to. He got his electrical permit and all was good. So uh, we turned this thing that wasn't a problem in the first place for a guy that saw a big problem and big big fines and fees and all that and put everything at ease and that was something for for me for the the rest of the month i'm just feeling so good walking around like man i'm helping people and out there in the world um, to get through things like this if it hadn't been for me he was gonna uh, have to pay these fines he was gonna have to tear apart uh, a lot of his his garage and he was gonna have to rebuild things just to comply with things that weren't actually rules. So, so that's a very small, easy to understand situation that uh, shows how these steps that we, we've, we helped him with can, can really, really uh, go a long way. Uh, we can get into things where we're convincing building departments that um, multi-unit 12 uh, dwelling uh, structures don't require fire sprinklers. And it all kind of boils down to kind of what I gave you in, in the example about the uh, traffic citation for the license plate, how when you read the codes, you read the language, what does it actually say? Uh, what, are, what are the assumptions people are making? And how can you get them to feel like they are part of your team so that when you work together, you can do what the rules say and uh, convince them that the thing that you believe is the, the right thing to do and the things that they're assuming may not actually be what the laws uh, say if you really, really dissect the language. What have you found, Joe, to be a good framework or a way to approach these conversations to be successful? And when people go check out your course, what kind of tips are they going to get about how to do this? Yeah, so s step one about this is to, to, to really uh, determine what are the actual rules to kind of separate out the difference between opinion 
and actual codified ordinances. And when you, when you do that, you can really isolate what problems do you really need to solve because you don't want to solve problems that aren't really problems, right? So that, that's really one of the, the key things to do here. So then once you do that and start onto the path of solving a, a real problem that really is a problem, uh, then it's about communication. How do you properly communicate with this person who is acting as an adversary so that you can hopefully get them to, to feel like they're part of your, your team? And that's where uh, this concept that I've learned, uh, I, I learned it from a, a book that I, I read um, about negotiating with hostages. And what it, what it said that really resonated with me was that the way people perceive what you say actually has very little to do with the words that came out of your mouth. So what they really, what people really perceive is your body language and your tone of voice. And there's, there's some, um, there's some ratio. I, I think it's like the body language. It's, it's at least 50% of what people, uh, interpret and internalize with how, uh, how you communicate. And the tone of your voice is, is up there. It's like 30 some percent. And the, the last little 10% sliver is what the actual words are. So what that really means is the words don't matter that much. It's a very, very small percentage of how people perceive what you have actually said to them. So if you mm. can kind of say to somebody with a smile on your face, I am going to murder your family. Like, <laughs> like that, that's the part where maybe that 10% might matter, but... Um, you're creating a uh, atmosphere where there's something about you, something about your charisma or something about your presentation where you can maybe convince people of things that maybe they wouldn't have um, really been convinced of had you not presented it in a different sort of way. Yeah, this sort of counts against me a little bit. Um, my wife always tells me I have RBF, you know, the, they're all, the good old resting bitch face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fifty five percent. Yeah, I can I can be saying something completely loving, compassionate comes across as very brusque and uh, and uh, confrontational. So, some of us have more uh, more automatic uh, expression of compassion than others. So, body language, huge tip, huge tip. And uh, how do you how do you find yourself implementing that when you're involved in these situations? It's becoming harder and harder because these uh, robots that we we mentioned earlier it's hard to get them in a face-to-face -face situation. They mainly just email nowadays. Uh, we don't have that in-person condition that we get to work with anymore. Uh, a lot of the building departments I work with, uh, some of them are still closed from COVID. And, oh, and wow. at the time of this recording, we're, um, what, we're three years since th that time, right? Something yeah, like that. since it started. Yeah, yeah. over three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Some of them are still closed. You can't walk in there. So now you're mm -hmm. isolated to either email, which is most of it. Now that's, this just sounds like an excuse to get out of having to service people at the front counter. Oh, man, COVID sure was <laughs> nice. We didn't have to deal with anyone. We didn't have to man the front counter. You know what? Let's just keep on. Let's just keep on. Let's just, uh, let's just keep on using this whole COVID thing. Yeah, and I think any, that's... Any of that going on? Oh yeah, there, that's that's part of it, and there's there's uh, pros and cons to this. The the um, that the con is that hey, we can't just easily walk in and force these people to engage with us and see our body language and and feel our tone because um, they're really pigeonholing you into sending them an email. The um, the other workaround to this is we can at least try to get them on the phone. They they don't they don't return phone calls very easily that's that's the experience that i have and a lot of my coworkers have uh, you really really have to work hard to get them on the phone and then if you're really lucky um, you set up a virtual meeting with them so that they can experience that tone of voice and the body language and i mean what, what do you feel right now enoch are you are you feeling the the body language and the chemistry from how we're talking at this moment is does that come through in this manner yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes through conversational, open, you know, warm. It feels, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 a okay substitute 
for actually being in person. I think we can yeah. communicate effectively in this manner. So a, a really big tip is just to try to divert the conversation from an email over to something that's at least a phone call or better yet, a virtual call. If you can get it in person, that's even even better um, because that, that's, that's where you're kind of locked into the best case scenario of getting all of those senses of communication locked in with the person that you're going to engage with. It's harder for them to turn you away. Yeah, beautiful. It reminds me of a little side note. It reminds me of one of my, my I have a, my sister's cousin who's just one of these, she's really flowery, very, um, how do you put it, uh, extroverted. She comes across very extroverted, very, uh, very warm, enthusiastic person. So just to underscore your point more, she once gave me a tip. She's like, Enoch, I was, uh, I was late for my plane and like, I was worried I wasn't going to get on. She was kind of needed some concessions to happen. Right. Because like she, she'd gotten there late and she's like, and she's like, and just, she's like, I laid it on thick. <sighs> oh my goodness. I just ran up a flight of stairs. Oh, oh, so good to see you today. Oh, how are you? Wow. That's a very nice shirt you have on. Oh, where are you headed, ma'am? I'm trying to get on the plane to Austin. I don't suppose there's anything you could possibly do. I mean, I've just come from X, Y, and Z and blah, 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 blah. Person feels sorry for him. Oh, sure, sure. Oh my goodness, you saved me so much. Thank you. How can I ever repay you? You know. And it was just I, I chuckled because I'm like, you know what? That's a good point. That's a good point. So I try. I try to bring. I've tried to practice. It's difficult, but I've tried to practice my uh, my my damsel in distress uh, <laughs> when I'm in the airport <laughs> as much as possible and added in a good dose of flattery and kindness. But you're right. I've seen that people respond to it. You know, and whether it's you know, whether it's people at the ticket counter, and let's face it, people who work for airlines deal with a lot of upset people because there's delayed flights, there's weather, there's people who just, you know, they didn't understand some regulation, you know, so people are very stressed out. So if you can be that fresh breath of fresh breath of air, like, oh man, the way you handled that last guy was brilliant. I mean, whew, you must have a master's degree in psychology to be able to deal with all these people, you know? They like to hear stuff like that. I imagine yeah. similar approach would work with uh, these plan check robots, possibly. Yeah, they're, the paradigm, like like you mentioned, when, when you walk up to them, the paradigm is that they're already uh, coming from a situation where they've dealt with 20 negative experiences before you. So it's, it is understandable that these people have... Um, they, they have a, a condition around them that's not very supportive. So if we can just be that breath of fresh air, like you said, that can uh, enable them to understand that, hey, we're trying to help people create housing or create this assisted living facility, and you're part of it. You get to be part of this. And paint the picture that uh, they're not just there to help you solve some sort of a problem, but to be part of some sort of big solution that helps their community and paint that picture for them rather than just diving right into uh, the problem that you're really trying to solve. So that's mm, absolutely that's, it. That's, that's really powerful. The, I call that the we approach, which is yes. instead of seeing someone as an adversary, kind of put your arm around them figuratively. Hey, this is a big problem and you know, you're part of this too. What do you think we could do here? Could we put our heads together? Um, how, what can I do in this situation? Any suggestions? You know, kind of approaching things that, you know, it's it's not me versus you, it's it's us. We have this project, it's going up in town and we're really excited about it and you're gonna be a part of it. Yeah, exactly. And also something you mentioned about your cousin, the way you phrased uh, one of the things was, you don't suppose there's something you can do. You can ask that same question in a different way, such as, is there something you can do? Okay, if you say, is there something you can do? The answer could very easily be no. But if you say, you don't suppose there's something you can do, the answer can eat more easily be yes, right? So when you make it easy for somebody to answer with a yes, you have now created a scenario where they have already told you one yes. And every yes that you can get, it creates a more positive vibe. So if you're very careful about how you phrase your questions so that you can make it easy for that adversary to feel like uh, they can 
later answer you in a supportive way, you're only going to make it that much easier for yourself. So I, I noticed that when you when you mentioned that earlier, it's like, yeah, that's that's exactly how it works. Nice, thank you, thank yeah. you, yeah. And another example is like, let's say for um, in a situation, if you want to get a very specific answer, but it, but the answer can be um, in in many different ways to the same exact question. So if I were to ask you, Enoch, what color is the sky? Blue. What would you say? Blue, of course. Of course it's blue. I knew you were going to say blue before I asked that question. But if I were to say, if, if I wanted the answer of white or gray, I can say, hey, Enoch, what color is the sky when it's cloudy out? Of course you're going to say white or gray or something to that effect. You're not going to say blue. So when you are dealing with one of these building officials and you know that there's a, a, a problem where there's ambiguity in how the code is written, you just don't want to go to this person and say, hey, what do I do here? Because they're, they're able to answer that question in any way they want. But if you can rephrase that question in a way where you can almost force them to answer it in the way that you want them to answer it, then obviously you're going to have a lot more success, just, just like this example with what color is the sky. You can do that with, with any sort of question, any sort of language, and guide the discussion in your favor uh, based on the outcome that you're, you're hoping for. But to do that, you really need to be a master of what the rules are. You need to know the codes better than they do. And that may seem very daunting, but you have to remember, when you are engaged in that conversation with this person, they just dealt with 20 people before you. Their mind is not wrapped around this situation as carefully as you may be wrapped into it. So therefore, you have done your study, studying. You have really researched this issue. You know it's, it's this 23.44.1.a. You know all the things by heart before you've picked up that phone or before you've walked into their office. So that way you can really guide that, that conversation and they are going to be, uh, they're, they're not going to be the ones who are the experts at that moment. You're going to be the expert because you've done your due diligence. So that gives you the upper hand on really guiding that conversation and asking the questions in a way that are, gonna, that are really going to get the answers that you want. And you, and you want to do that in a way where you build an argument. You ask sort of preliminary questions first so that once they give the answers, you can then build upon those answers and reference them later in the discussion. So you could say, yeah, I remember you said X, so therefore, because of X, then we're going to do Y. And it's going to be very hard for them to go back on what they said because they want to be right. They're, they're never going to change their mind about something. So you really can use that to your advantage. Uh, the the uh, interesting thing about these codes that we're, we're dealing with is they are ambiguous. The intent is that the codes are written in a way where they can apply to every building in the world of that particular construction type, of that particular occupancy. So there's no way they can write these things in a perfect way. So of course there's going to be ambiguity in there. And that's what we can use to our advantage. And as a, a very highly skilled architect who's a master of your craft, who wants to do a good building that's going to be safe and effective, we can use that ambiguity in our favor to get the answers that we want so that it can perform at its best and not let that building department take advantage of us and give us some sort of a interpretation that's not aligned with those goals. So we got to stick Beautiful. up for ourselves. I mean, if we don't, who will? Yeah, exactly. Joe, what, I, I know that there's a lot of firm owners deal with the difficult situation of being the ones where all the problems rise to the top, so to speak. So a lot of practice owners, especially running small practices, they're the ones who are having to jump in and handle these challenging conversations with building officials. What would you recommend for firm owners to be able to train their staff up? Because I'm sure 
if they could get this problem off their plate, if they had a way to be able to distill this information down into a team member, where a team member could then handle these things adroitly, that would get huge value for a practice. Yeah, it, and it's interesting because if you really think back, Enoch, to the training that you got to be the master at doing permitting or or dealing with code issues or whatever, I bet you couldn't pinpoint a time where anybody ever gave <laughs> you that like, sort of training. I'm like, what training are we talking about? You mean me yeah. reading through the code like five yes. times to try to understand what it means? Yes. Yep. There, there is none, right? Um, there, there is nothing, nothing that I ever got, nothing that you ever got. It's, it's just trial by fire, the school of hard knocks. You learn it on the streets. Uh, so what, what I am endeavoring to do is to give people something where they at least have a starting point to not have to learn the hard way for 10 years, but to take a shortcut and get a few tips and tricks where they can uh, learn some of this craft and uh, learn to master it in a much faster timeline. And, and, that, and that's what I've put together with, with this permit problem guide. And it, it outlines some of those steps. And with practice, uh, you're, you're going to be much, much better off than getting, getting no training at all like, like you got and like I, I got as well. Beautiful. Where, where can people go to find out more about the permit training guide and what will they find when they get over there? Yeah, so the, the permit uh, problem guide, it's, it's .com, permitproblemguide.com. And there's, there's kind of uh, two paths you can go. One is like dipping your toes. It's a, it's a mini course, and it, it just goes through uh, some very um, short summary outlines of steps that you can uh, incorporate uh, to try and deal with uh, big, big picture problems. Uh, then we also have a full course where uh, you have a lot of case studies, um, a lot of uh, examples of very specific situations for how to uh, deal with a, a particular problem. So you, you might say, hey, I have this problem with fire sprinklers or this problem with accessory dwelling units. And uh, we have stuff built into that where you can just hone right in on that particular topic and see how other people have have dealt with it and we're always expanding on and adding more content to this thing over time as uh, either myself or or other people who are taking these courses share their their success stories and failure stories because uh, we're a community trying to figure out how to work together and and uh, broaden all of our knowledge base together beautiful i yeah. love it well joe Great having you on. And before we jump, before we jump off here today, let's just drop a little. Uh, I would like to drop a little bonus content for our members because there was something interesting that happened behind the scenes of business of architecture and the podcast process here that I talked to you about before we came on here. And it's important with regards to how architects run their practices and particularly how they get work and how they make things happen efficiently in their practice. So Joe reached out to my team back in May. Right now, as of this recording, it's October. So May, June, July, August, September, October, six months later, okay? Uh, the first time he reached out, Jackie on my team, you know, we have pretty high high bar, so to speak, in terms of like very specific people that we accept on the podcast. And so Jackie said, hey, look, at the moment, we're not accepting anyone. Uh, and so then Joe graciously, uh, you know, took that on board and said, great, uh, any chance that might change in the future. And then Jackie wrote back and she said, hey, in September, now, also, I'm very busy. I'm hard to get a hold of. And sometimes vetting podcast guests is not highest on my priority list. And so it's one of the things that kind of gets bumped to the bottom. So I went back and I looked in our email and Joe had actually followed up eight times uh, with his value proposition for the podcast, basically starting out with the problem. Here's the problem that I see in the market. Here's the solution. Here's some tips. And here's what would be valuable to your audience. Just brilliant, brilliant pitch to come on the podcast. And here's the problem, like sometimes when we're running businesses and when we're architects and when we see things happen in the world, we don't really know what happens behind the scenes, like what it really takes to be successful in the world. Okay. If you go back to my, there's a couple of podcast interviews that I've done with business development managers and people that are in that role. And they talk about having to follow up multiple, multiple times. They just keep on following up patiently and, and, and politely until they either get a definite yes or no, or even if it's a no sometimes. You can keep, keep keep following up, right? So for those of you listening here, 
from the outside, oftentimes it can seem, oh, you know, Joe must be the most amazing person in the world, which he, he pretty much is. But, you know, he's special. That's why he was able to get on the podcast. No, he, he had good content. He was diligent in reaching out. Set a calendar reminder to follow back up. Followed back up in September. And here we are doing the interview. You know, it sounds familiar. Um, we have building departments telling us no. We have Enix Sears telling us no. But hey, here we are, right? Here so are. just because somebody tells you no doesn't mean that that's the final answer. When we are confident in what we can do with the value that we can add, sometimes you need to keep asking or sometimes you need, need to keep telling that building department official so that you can get the answer that everybody really needs. The reason I'm I'm really here is exactly why uh, what, what I started with. I don't want people to take advantage of architects anymore. That That's it. This needs to stop. Charge, ra raise your fees, guys. You're, you're not charging Amen. enough. Can we can say, wait, pause. Er, please <laughs> say that again, Joe. Say that again. Yes, raise your fees, people. The, you know, you are extraordinarily intelligent. I know you're all hardworking. Do yourselves a favor. Don't undersell yourself. Don't let these clients take advantage of you because it's it's happening over and over again. And we just need to stand up for ourselves. And and that's that's what I'm here to, to really convince everybody of. When those when those building departments tell you no, please ask why. Please stand up for yourself. Please look into it further. Excellent which is exactly where our missions align. So it's been so great having you here. We're all about architects raising their fees, becoming ridiculously wealthy, having big impact, having fun along the way. So Joe, thank you for dropping some awesome knowledge bombs here. Go find out more about the Permit Problem Guide at permitproblemguide.com. Be a great resource for you, for your team members. Here's the thing, young team members, I mean, I wish I would have had something like this back in the day for me because some of these little, just little tips about human to human communication can go a long ways. And if your team members learn this in, in practice with a permit, you know, official, shoot, where else could they apply it? With a contractor, right? With a client. And then what happens is you start, you start getting closer to that beautiful thing we call the free architect that we teach here at Smart Practice. So Joe, again, Thank you for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. Today's episode is sponsored by Enscape. Enscape is a plugin software that simplifies real-time visualization for us in the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. Whether your go-to design application is Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD, or Vectorworks, Enscape lets you instantly create high-quality renderings by syncing data from your 3D model without additional import or export needed. Easily navigate every aspect of your design in real time and identify and resolve any issues that you come across. Plus, you can immerse your clients as an added bonus in VR to provide a real tangible sense of the project. Enscape is used by over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries, and you can experience it yourself. We encourage you to go check it out at chaos-enscape.com forward slash trial-14 or simply by Googling Try Enscape. You can also find the link in the notes of this podcast episode. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.